Well, today I want to let you to let yourself be transported back over 2,000 years to the ancient city of Jerusalem. You live far away, but you've just arrived the night before for the Passover festival. You step outside into the morning air. Carts rattle through the dust-covered streets. The city is teeming with people. A cacophony of noise fills the air. You hear so many different languages as you walk through the streets. You're making your way to the temple. Jews have come from all over for this festival, descending on this ancient sacred city, this place where your people believe God dwells with them. Now you've come here before, you've made a pilgrimage before to God's house here in Jerusalem, that magnificent, imposing temple. But you notice something different this time. The effects of Roman occupation are quite evident. Not only are the streets full of Roman soldiers keeping the peace, but there are far more beggars in the streets this year, far more homeless and housing insecure, far more peasants. Rome has been sitting on the backs of the people, overtaxing them for a while now, and anyone with eyes can see how pressed down the people of this city are feeling. As you walk through the streets, you notice one man standing among a crowd of day laborers. He's waiting with a look of desperation for someone, anyone, to pick him for a job. He's got the characteristic grime of someone who spends a lot of time on the streets. His robes are a bit tattered. And yet something about him looks startlingly familiar. He looks up and, and catches your eye and clearly recognizes you too. You realize that you met him on your last pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but he looked quite different back then, dressed in fine robes and all very well kept. You recall that his family had owned an estate just outside of Jerusalem, some land that had been in their family for hundreds of years. A relative of yours had brought you out there for a dinner party one night. You had laughed and laughed together with this man around his table that night, enough to call him a friend. Upon recognizing you, he quickly looks down clearly ashamed of his current estate. You don't want to add to his shame, but you do want to know what happened to him. Hello, friend. Shalom. Shalom to you and your family. At that, your friend tears up. He tells you how his family got behind on their taxes and they couldn't catch up. He tells you how the tax collector always wanted more and more to pad his own pockets, and eventually it buried your family. He tells you how they lost their land, and now the temple records show of land ownership a different family's name for their property. Clearly your friend is distraught. He tells you that he and his family are now renting a small apartment here in Jerusalem. They've been reduced to, to begging and trying to find day labor each day just to pay the bills and put food on the table. You ask your friend if he's going to the temple this week. I can't show my face there looking like this, he says, pointing down at his tattered robes. You bid him well and continue on your journey, but you can't shake his story. 
You can't shake that look of shame. It was crushing. As you get closer to the temple, a woman of similar street grime is cradling a baby. And she holds up a small clay pot to you as you pass her. Please, sir, my family has traveled a very long way to get here, but we were robbed. We don't have money for a sacrifice. We need God's blessing. My child is sick. Please, can you spare any change? Your heart breaks, but you barely brought enough for your own sacrifice at the temple. You apologize for not being able to help her, and you continue on your way. As you walk into the outer courts of the temple, you see another family. A fairly emaciated child is begging his father for food. But his father, standing in the line to change money, sternly tells him, we've only got two denarii, and we've got to spend them on a dove for a sacrifice. Again, your heart breaks, but you're not sure what to do. You stand there for a moment in the temple courtyards, overwhelmed by the poverty that you see all around you, overwhelmed by all these people who feel cut off from access to God because they can't afford it. And then out of the corner of your eye, you see a flurry of motion. Chaos breaks out all around you. People are running and screaming. A rabbi that you had just seen outside the temple gates, peacefully teaching his disciples, he's entered the courtyard. And like a madman, he's going around flipping the tables of the money changers, flipping the tables of those who are selling animals for sacrifice. Coins are scattering and rolling all over the stones of the temple ground. He's got a whip in his hand. Now he's not hurting anyone, but he's certainly scaring the crowd. He cracks the whip in the air and drives all the cattle and the sheep out of the courtyard. And when he gets to the sellers of the doves, the cheapest animal that can be purchased for sacrifice, the ones that the poor, like that father, have to choose between buying and feeding their children, when he gets to them, he shouts at them, get out of here. Stop turning my Abba's house into a marketplace. Some of the vendors, they run in fear, while others crawl on the ground desperately trying to collect their scattered coins. And still others of them hurry to get the temple authorities. As all the chaos begins to die down, you hear someone whisper behind you. And you turn and you notice that it's some of the disciples you had seen listening to this rabbi just outside the gates. Remember, one of them says to the other, it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. You wonder, <laughs> Do they really think their rabbi, this madman, is the long-promised Messiah? Sure, certainly not. The temple leadership, who at this point have been alerted by some of the vendors, they come rushing out into the courtyard. But by now, of course, everything is relatively calm, if in absolute disarray. And they ask the madman rabbi, Show us a sign that you have the authority to do this here in this temple. The rabbi gives a rather quizzical answer that sounds a little bit like the delusional mumblings of sch schizophrenic people that you have met. Except he doesn't mumble it. Destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it, he says. He says it with a steady confidence. The temple leaders look at each other, eyebrows raised. They scoff at him. <laughs> it 
It took 46 years to build this temple. You think you're going to raise it in three days? Clearly, this rabbi is truly crazy. But on the other hand, he seems more grounded and centered than anyone you've ever encountered. You can't really explain it. It's bizarre. It's only years later, after this rabbi has been crucified, that you are in Jerusalem on pilgrimage yet again, and you get to talking to one of his former disciples. You hear that what that rabbi had meant by temple that day when he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it, what he had meant was his own body. His disciples tell you how they discovered in their time with him that God wasn't just accessible in the temple, but everywhere among all people. That sacrifices and even the temple itself wasn't necessary to find God. That what draws us close to God is what the prophet Micah talked about, doing justice, showing mercy, walking humbly with God. They say they once heard their rabbi talking to a Samaritan woman at a well, which is a scandal in and of itself, but he was telling her that she could access God by sharing water with him and receiving water from him. They share with you how they themselves experienced God's presence in this rabbi, this one who so embodied love and how he taught them to experience God in friends and even in the strangers they met, especially the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized. That it's only in the brokenness and injustice of human systems that some are made to feel that they can't afford to draw close to God. They tell you that their rabbi may have only flipped tables in the temple that one day, but that he was always constantly shaking things up, making them rethink things, asking them to reimagine and to step out of their comfort zone. He would never let them just go through the motions of religion without constantly making them ask themselves, are the institutions and the structures and the, the systems in which I'm participating, are those all in line with God's values of beloved community. As you talk further to this, these disciples, they tell you that they never met someone so good at putting love into action as this madman rabbi you saw in the courtyard that one time. They tell you how others felt threatened by that love in action and it had eventually landed him on the cross but how even the grave couldn't stop their rabbi's wild love. How he, the true temple of God, had been raised three days after being killed, and how people could still find their way home to God through him and through his way of love. After you finish that conversation, you think back to that day in the temple courtyards, you think back to how that rabbi cracked that whip and flipped those tables. You still feel, feel somewhat uncomfortable with all the chaos he caused that day. But you know what? It wasn't like there was really peace there in that courtyard that day anyway. Maybe he just brought the tension of injustice to the surface that day you start to wonder if maybe it wasn't him that was crazy, but all those systems that kept all those people you met in the streets that day from feeling like they could come home to God. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God.